went on strike and had a sit-in, who was to be seen there talking to them, sympathising with them? It was a Tony Blair. Any great march and demonstration, there he was at the head of the column. And he became very much more a public uh, radical figure, socialist figure, uh, than uh, he had ever been before in his lifetime. And his influence steadily increased. In many ways, I mean, it's, um, he, he is Labour's last leader. He is the man who was more superbly equipped than anyone else uh, to fulfill the functions of a really dynamic and successful Labour leader. Politician Tony Benn is making yes, yes. personal appearance yes. and signing yes. copies of his latest book, right. Arguments for Socialism, in the picture gallery. After the 1979 defeat, Tony Benn threw all his energy into spreading his latest ideas in books, pamphlets and speeches. I've never regarded Tony as a careerist or opportunist. I think he genuinely had a conversion. He read Marx for the first time when he was in his 50s and thought he was absolutely marvellous and told us so. But of course he was exactly the sort of feudal socialist, the upper class socialist, who was satirised by Karl Marx himself in the Communist Manifesto as a man who could make the bourgeoisie cringe with the wit of his satire, but basically totally ineffective in politics because of a total failure to understand the way in which the world was changing. And that was enormously true of Tony. I mean, if Tony had been right, Thatcher would never have been elected. That's very nice. Before the election of 79, I resolved that even if we won, I wouldn't serve in the cabinet. I'm not sure that if we had one, Jim Callaghan would have put me in the cabinet, but that's by the by, and I told the secretary of my local party, Dawn Primarolo, that when the election was over, I would go on the back benches, and I did. I didn't stand for the shadow cabinet, because I felt really that what was needed was some way of tackling this problem of a totally independent parliamentary leadership that got into power on the basis of the movement and then um, kicked away the ladder. And I did think, and I still think, that was a very, very important thing to do. Uh, but in that sense, I was reflecting a lot of feeling that was very strongly held outside. In the summer of 1979, Tony Benn announced to his friends on the left of the Shadow Cabinet that Britain was becoming a police state and he was severing his links with them. His colleague, Michael Foote, told him, you're nuts. But away from Westminster, Benn inspired Labour activists and young socialists. I think he was reconciled, if you like, to the defeat and thought, not only for his personal reasons, he no doubt thought he, his policies were better for the party as well because he could convince himself as well as other people very readily. He's a very persuasive person. But I do think it was a terrible misjudgment because he thought he could wrench the whole party in his direction and win uh, control over the party and then go on to... Uh, recover on that basis. So I don't think there was any real possibility of that happening. So that was uh, uh, when Tony Benn didn't seem to realise the consequences of the defeat of that 79. I think it was a terrible mistake on his part. Tony Benn wanted nothing short of a revolution in the Labour Party. In his diary he wrote that the left's campaign for reform was a popular uprising with roots in the history of the working class struggle. All I would say is that at the time of the Peasants' Revolt, feudalism in Britain was breaking down just as capitalism is breaking down at this moment. He wanted party members to have the power to sack their MPs, to have a say in the choice of party leader and to influence the policies which went into the manifesto. For him, the ordinary members had been ignored for too long. His crusade, he said, was conducted in their name and on their behalf. I used to point out that if the Pope, uh, if the Church hadn't addressed the faithful every Sunday for 2,000 years and the Pope had relied on a photo opportunity at Lourdes, masterminded by a public relations man, it's unlikely the Church would have been as strong. And so I think there was a sense of excitement. Discussion is a radical thing. Uh, and silence and obedience and bow to your leader is a very conservative thing. 
and democracy is exciting, and this was a genuine expression of people's opinions. I think many of Tony Benn's ideas are crazy. I think he's pursued them with an unscrupulousness which uh, is deplorable. I think he's a great believer in personal aggrandizement of one sort, but I do not believe that he is a careerist. If Tony Benn had wanted to be leader of the Labour Party, I think he probably could have been had he taken different decisions 15 years ago. He sacrificed the prospects of being leader by pursuing these crazy ideas. He pursued them unscrupulously, but he didn't pursue them with the intention of becoming leader of the Labour Party. He became obsessed, dominated by the party itself, you know, and uh, how we must put it back into control of the workers. Uh, and that sidetracked us for years. We went down arguing, I think Michael Foote said, how many angels can dance on a pin, uh, of a nonsense. The public weren't interested. Unemployment was rocketing, and here was the Labour Party just arguing and arguing forever about reselection and how we choose the leader. Right-wing MPs were worried. In those constituencies dominated by the left, they feared the loss of their traditional independence in Parliament. Comrade Chairman and comrades, I think there's no doubt that conference which um, has time and time again put forward resolutions, put forward all the ideas current in the movement but, uh, which have not been carried out by the leadership. If we are to ensure that they are carried out, then we have to have leadership which is elected by the conference. They wanted to turn the Labour Party into a Stalinist party which was not controlled by the people but was controlled by a number of inner party organisations which then imposed their wishes on the government. That was their agenda, to turn the Labour Party into a Stalinist party and they got, a, from their point of view, a good way along the road to succeeding, though in the end, fortunately, they were stopped. Well, that sounds like Gerald's very colourful language and that's absolute nonsense. Uh, we were for democratising the party in terms of the uh, election of the leader of the party and the selection of MPs in the party because, you know, no one's bigger than the party. I mean, all these people who, when they become members of parliament, think that they were elected because they made wonderful speeches and they're very pretty and they're very clever um, and the world owes them a living simply isn't borne out by the reality of the situation. This is a constituency meeting. In, in local parties, dedicated left-wingers went to meetings week after week to study the rules and constitution of the Labour Party. It was um, always decried as being a sort of, oh, that lot, they're all fanatical for detail and rule changes. Um, and the right, in many cases, simply didn't realise the importance of what was going on or the understanding that a very large number of people had. Now, there is the, there is the amendment from the National Executive on page 7 but you really need to turn to pages 20 to 24 or so. When we were accused of being sort of constitutionalists, Tony Benn used to say this isn't an arid constitutional debate. This issue goes to the heart of the activities and the structure of the Labour movement and the right of ordinary people to influence what goes on in the Labour movement. The activists in the party were often the object of deep suspicion. The right feared their campaign and resented their zeal. Constituency parties, through which the ordinary membership was represented, they tended to be, almost by definition, unrepresentative of Labour voters because ordinary Labour voters were not prepared to give up an evening, a week, sometimes more, going to drafty schoolrooms to talk politics or to go around canvassing or making members. But the activist was not representative of the rank and file any more than in the Tory party, the blue rinse Tory matrons are representative of the average Tory voter. What we're doing is coming round and uh, asking if you would like to join the Labour Party. The term activist became a term of abuse. I mean, if you're a vicar in the church, you're a Christian activist. If you're an entrepreneur, you're a capitalist activist. If you're a, an editor of a paper, you're a journalist activist. And the word activist made, uh, gave the impression of contempt for people who did anything. Just to play bowls and or cricket and watch telly, and you're just the sort of labor man we want. We don't want any involvement, please. Don't tell us what you think. Uh, your job is to get us there and then shut up. 